Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're about ready to start. We're just going to take another couple of minutes and let a few more people file in here, and then we will get started. from Irmo, South Carolina. All right, I think we're about ready. Um, welcome to Connecting State of the Art Virtual Production. I am Lisa Gerber, Director of Business Development for m and &E at Packet Fabric. I am joined by AJ Wedding and Christopher Cope of Orbital Studios. AJ is the co-founder and director of virtual production, and Christopher is co-founder and vice president of sales and marketing for Orbital Virtual Studios. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello. And uh, also, stay tuned. We do have a special guest who will be joining us in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and I was also asked to let you know that everybody who stays until the very end uh, will be eligible for an Amazon gift card. So you don't want to miss that. So stay tuned and stick around. Um, so a brief overview of what we'll be going over to over today. Uh, you're beginning really a full introduction of our new partner, uh, Orbital Studios. This is a partnership that Packet Fabric announced the week before last wherein Packet Fabric is connecting Orbital's uh, stage in downtown Los Angeles with an on-premise pop. We're really excited about this use case of connected stages and uh, also the people that we get to be working with, just the whole team at Orbital, including obviously Chris and AJ here. So we're going to talk today about who Orbital is, what they're doing with virtual production, and what tools and methods are really setting them apart from a creative standpoint um, and also what sets them apart from an infrastructure and connectivity standpoint and how infrastructure and connectivity is directly supporting uh, production use cases and workflows at the stage. So uh, let's just dive in, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna start with you. Talk a bit about the origin story behind Orbital. You know, what was the impetus for you and AJ to, to build a facility in the first place that had this concept of state of the art um, top of mind, both creatively speaking, right? But also in terms of how the way it's built with infrastructure and connectivity. Yeah, so really the impetus um, uh, was money. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, uh, for a long time, AJ and I have been working together and um, uh, we, of course, as creatives, kind of have our own ideas about how things should operate. But shortly before the pandemic, he and I started talking about um, <clears throat> what we would like to do um, post-pandemic. What do we want to do with our, our lives and, um, um, and how can we make an impact? And so we started looking into virtual production um, at that time. And um, so during the pandemic, we did an extensive amount of research and testing, and we contacted a lot of um, providers of equipment and uh, uh, basically zeroed in on the idea that we do want to get into this uh, space, uh, but we want to do it properly. And uh, we want to take our time. We want to make sure that the equipment we're buying um, is going to last for you know a, a longer period of time in terms of usage. And so we wanted to do as much as we could to insulate ourselves from 
technological developments. I mean, as a new technology, you always have to be concerned with that. And so we took the time uh, to do the research. Uh, we took the time to um, really test everything and, and uh, listen to what we were hearing out in the marketplace and some of the challenges that people were uh, running into and, and trying to overcome those challenges and see how we could develop a company that wasn't just a technology-based company. It wasn't just a company that was focused on renting you know, equipment out to the production industry. And this, neither of those are, are you know, the, the soul of our company, if you will. We wanted to figure out how this technology could make the process of uh, creating content uh, for you know, the people in our industry um, more efficient. Um, how does it work to provide a better final product, if you will? Um, so we wanted to see how it could complement the process, not replace anything necessarily, because um, the, the industry is what the industry is. And, and um, we have a lot of skilled people that know what they're doing, and we don't want to uh, put any handcuffs on that necessarily. So it was kind of like a slow introduction into what we are, what we are working on. And one of the, I guess, the premises of our of our company's development was to say, if we really want to make this um, a useful tool to the industry for the production industry, we want to hire people that come from the production industry. And so that's really um, the foundation of Orbital Studios um, is uh, everybody that works with us has a has a, a background in the production industry. And so everything we do is focused on how do we make this a better process? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned sort of the process as it was, right? So traditional production and then going into virtual production. And there's obviously been a bit of a sea change and new tools and new methods and LED. Um, so for those of, of us who don't know and aren't that familiar with production or even with the entertainment industry, uh, AJ, if you could just tell us a bit about virtual production, you know, start high level. What is virtual production and what makes it different and what different needs does it have? Well, virtual production is kind of a catch-all phrase for a, a series of tools that have been developed over the last decade. And um, I think we're most recently brought all into one sort of cohesive tool uh, during the production of The Mandalorian. Um, and what this is, is, is essentially we have a, a massive LED wall uh, with a camera tracking system where basically we're able to take what you would have done in post-production with, with green screen and take those assets that you would have put in later and have them happen live in camera uh, via game engine. And so what that allows you to do is get a lot more of your shots in camera, which makes them look better because the DP can see what he's lighting. Um, and in theory, overall speed up production. You know, the nice thing about game engine technology is that uh, they call it real time rendering. So normally if you, if you make a movie, like I believe the Matrix, the latest Matrix movie was, uh, if you counted up the rendering hours across all the machines, it was 147 years of rendering. Um, so if you can cut that down by having real-time rendering for you know, a number of your shots, then you're, um, it's more efficient and, uh, and it actually allows for more collaboration uh, of the department heads. So for instance, if I'm building out a, 3D environment that's eventually going to be projected on the wall and tracked to the camera. During that entire process of building it out in a game engine, I can, as the director, go in there with a VR headset and set up, you know, place actors and place lighting and make my storyboards and talk to the production designer. And he can have, he or she can have their input. And, uh, everyone gets to work together in a more collaborative space instead of having, you know, one storyboard artist here and one scenic designer here and one, you know, it's everyone can collaborate in that same space and it just makes a more cohesive piece at the end. So larger files, right. From oh, all yeah. of this, right. So larger files and then also more sharing with all of these offsite teams that you're talking about and more collaboration is involved. So, so right off the bat, this concept of, of data mobility is introduced as being more significant as a part of the process. Um, I want to take a minute and show a video. Uh, do you want to show that now? Sure. Okay, show this reel? Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. This is something. This is Orbital's reel. 
just to give you a sense of, of the, the work that they do. <laughs> So, so one of the things uh, that I think is unique about what we do is, as Cope said, you know, we, we came at this as filmmakers and um, contrary to what he said about uh, us doing this for money, I think the initial idea was, uh, you know, we saw what they had to use on The Mandalorian. And while it was groundbreaking and amazing, it still had plenty of problems. And, and we thought, you know what, let's go at these problems and see if we can make this a better set of tools for filmmakers. And, you know, every time we went down a rabbit hole of, you know, how do we fix this issue? How do we fix that issue? And we start working with different brand partners to adjust their technology and make better tools. We started to get to a point where now we had something where filmmakers didn't have to change what they did in order to use the tool. You know, that's that's been the case thus far. And one of the rabbit holes that we ended up going down had to do with connectivity and um, data center standards. And that was something that um, the group Medca and uh, Sean Tachkowski really schooled us in those um, methods and, and those things to try to sort of eliminate latency wherever possible, which is a huge thing for us. And of course, like you said, Lisa, um, the data management, you know, we have so much data coming in and going out simultaneously when we have a major production that we almost couldn't do this business without uh, someone like Packet Fabric. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, I mean, it does seem that, so Sean came along and, and Sean uh, Tekowski built this data center at your stage. So you guys have an on-premise data center and you've effectively become not just stage owners and creators, but data center operators, you know? So this, this is kind of a shift, right, from your um, purely creative focus. And how are you viewing, um, I guess, how are you viewing a industry adoption of that on a broader scale? Do you think that that's what's in the future? Do you also think that there's got to be a bit of a shift as far as how you think about education and hiring and, you know, all of it? Has that shifted your mindset of how to kind of make that transition? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny that I, I feel like a few years ago, we were all trying to go to the cloud. And I think now um, we're realizing, especially in entertainment, that we need to come back to earth, you know, and for us to have these data centers on stage, on site is super important. And I, I think that the future is going to be that every major movie studio is going to have a data center attached uh, for production mm. uh, because of that data throughput that's required. Um, as far as industry adoption, um, I think that some of the majors who are already starting to adopt virtual production and some of these uh, multinational shows like Game of Thrones that are getting produced, they're already dealing with those issues and having to answer those problems with sort of high throughput um, data centers. Uh, so I think it's starting to be adopted much the same way that uh, virtual production is being adopted. You know, most of our work right now for television for shows like Snowfall and um, Justified for FX are uh, video playback as opposed to game engine three-dimensional tracking. Um, and that's an adoption issue. It's a learning issue 
Uh, and so we're constantly trying to educate people about the need to, or, or the positives of using virtual production. Um, and then of course, you know, there's that, there's that data center and those standards in the background that are working to support the creative that they don't necessarily have to understand, but when they know that they're there and they make what they do possible, I think that's the biggest thing. Right, exactly, when it's able to be applied. So to that point, um, OCN, original camera negative, or camera to cloud, um, VAD, a virtual art department, uh, these are real world you know, applications of where uh, data mobility like this becomes kind of imperative. Um, do you think that the stakes are even higher for that data mobility now because of virtual production? And also, if you could just kind of give us a synopsis of what those use cases are and, and how they come into play in the, in the day to day of a production, starting with, I guess, camera to cloud. Sure. I mean, there are a few really good uses for camera to cloud. Um, one has to do with um, approvals, say network approvals. If there can be a live feed from the camera um, into the network exec's office, then they don't have to travel and come to the set. Um, for editorial or visual effects to have immediate uh, access to these uh, takes as they come from the camera, there's no downloading, there's no uploading. Um, it really helps speed along that process as well. And, you know, there have been times when not having it has really hurt as well. I know of multiple situations where uh, a virtual production stage um, had producers and directors on their way driving to the stage and wanted to see the new files, but the new files are downloading. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's an hour, and then all of a sudden it's two hours. You know, and then they, they all get there and they're mad because they can't see what they came to see. And, um, you know, the top three people on the call sheet, the director and the producer and the DP, their time is super important. And for them to be standing around waiting is uh, probably someone getting fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stakes are high. Mission critical. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I want to look for a second at some of the specifics when we talk about this. Um, in terms of security, either one of you, um, you know, we've heard obviously security is important for the entertainment industry. But when you have what you just talked about, which is, you know, VFX polls going to visual effects companies, and that is studio IP, you know, the emphasis on security has got to be just paramount, right? So in your experience, what is it like when it's you're in an environment where it's just not up to, uh, it's not dependable? Well, go ahead, go. Yeah, I was going to say it's uh, it, it creates challenges um, not only for us but for the production itself. Uh, you know, this this security and bandwidth issues, um, as AJ mentioned earlier, from a, a latency is is the the biggest issue um, that we run into in this industry um, or this aspect of the industry. Um, but beyond that, the security is something that's uh, of paramount importance to. To productions. I mean, nobody wants their IP to, to get into the hands of um, a competitor. Uh, certainly, you know, scripts that are going to be, you know, used in, in future productions or content creation. And, and so being able to communicate um, on a secured line, if you will, or a secured pipe um, from our studio, or if we're remote, um, if we deploy a, um, an LED wall to another location outside of Los Angeles or, or, or outside of the country to be able to um, have those secure lines uh, for our customers is, is uh, I mean, it really is a game changer for them. And, and many of them won't simply work in a studio that doesn't have that kind of secured access. So um, yeah, I was going to say, if you look at somebody like Netflix, you know, they create standards for deliverables, they create standards for what you're able to shoot with. You know, there are camera standards. There's LED wall standards now for Netflix. And I'm sure very soon they're going to come out with uh, a standard of needing to have, you know, a secure uh, internet provider for the stage. Right. Or even being able to bypass the public internet and use a private network. Absolutely. Right. And that's what's great about having packet fabric on site is to be able to create, I mean, effectively be our own pop and, and create those internet pipes for these companies. And so literally we create these things through your technology. Um, nobody has access to it except them. 
and um, uh, and and those who they deem you know worthy to have access. The only thing we can do is turn it on and turn it off. So it's um, it's a, it's a great tool, and it is it is really a tool um, that is a necessary tool for production, not just the security but the speed as well. So right, um, which it's yeah, it takes us to bandwidth. Right, you talked about camera to cloud, and you have a hundred gig port on site or you can have multiple ports because it is on site, right? And you have multiple stages, multiple LED volumes. Um, that's something that is able to support this idea of camera to cloud because those files for those who aren't in production are massive, right? If, if it's camera raw um, or OCN or whatever you wanna call it, you need that bandwidth to be able to, to meet those needs. And then 100 gigs can scale down. So it doesn't have to be 100 gigs all the time. It can be one, it can be 10. And then it can scale back up again in a nimble way where it's like somebody who's shooting for a day or two days or, you know, you don't often have productions that are there for a year <laughs> and need that kind of longer term. Well, that's kind of uh, an interesting point, because if somebody like Amazon wants to go shoot somewhere and they're going to be there for two months, usually what they end up having to do is send out their own um, IT team to then set up uh their own pipe and do a contract for a year. And, uh, you know, they're stuck paying that. So mm -hmm. with something like packet fabric, they could, you know, do it for a week and, probably, and potentially save a lot of money and also just the setup time. That's right. Yep. Um, and then this, this last one sort of goes to a, um, Automation, insta provisioning and redundancy. You know, I, I sort of look at this as almost a culture of production thing. We talked about um, the urgency of that uh, rapid operational tempo, which is a phrase that I really like that I heard recently. Um, just this notion that it's a it's mission critical. So failing is not an option if you're only hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake. Time is money. And if something goes down, um, you're losing that time and therefore that money. Um, but talk about, I guess, in terms of virtual production, how those stakes, again, have changed. Is that even more important now, just that sort of that failover, that redundancy, and also that, that time to provisioning? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the cost of production time, you know, anywhere from $6,000 per minute to $30,000 per minute, depending on the size of your budget. Um, and what you end up with is this digital file and how many things can go wrong with these digital files. So of course you wanna have as many backups as you possibly can. And I guarantee if you tell the studio, they can have a live feed to the camera where they can back it up directly to their server, they're gonna want that every time. And it just adds a level of redundancy. You know, of course we're gonna have our digital backups on set, but you know, I'm sure that safety of having that in house uh, is a huge thing for them. Mm -hmm. Something that Sean um, talks about a lot too is um, this idea of sustainability, right? And, and reducing our carbon footprint, um, which is terrific and a, a wonderful way to look at this. I mean, um, sneaker net has typically been the, and historically it's like, you know, uh, to hand somebody a drive who's gonna then drive it across town or, you know, all these other ways of, of doing it that are now changing. Talk about, I guess, uh, that aspect of things. And I think, Chris, we had talked about this recently. So if you want to take that one. I, I actually lost a little bit of what you said. Can you um, hear me now? Yeah, I can. Okay. Not a packet fabric connection here. So. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about um, carbon footprint and sustainability mm -hmm. and this notion that it used to be more leaning towards sneaker net and, you know, driving, literally driving drives. Um, where they need to go and how that's changing. Yeah, that's uh, one of the other things that uh, we are focused on as a company is um, how we, you know, what our what our carbon footprint is, what is our impact on um, on the planet, if you will. And uh, that's really kind of the great thing about uh, virtual production is um, there are times where our carbon footprint can be as little as. 10% uh, of what you would typically have with a uh, production. And so um, it's everything from practical, what we call practical set pieces, which are the physical items that are on a set or, or building an entire elaborate type of set. Uh, virtual production provides us the ability to create 
um, much of that uh, visual, if you will, for the consumer um, uh, digitally. And, um, and so we use fewer practical set pieces um, on the actual set. And um, we also require less crew members. And so um, there's, there are less people. Um, there's, all of the positions are still necessary, but you don't always have to have you know, an enormous crew of people to, to run a particular production. There are also ways in which um, we can save time and energy. Whenever you go on location, for example, for a production, um, you're going to have permits, you're going to have to set up what we call base camp, you're going to have to transport everybody there, uh, you're going to have to feed everybody, um, you have to bring out all of the equipment, and uh, it's, it's a pretty long and drawn out process. And what virtual production allows us to do is uh, do that one time. And so if you are uh, working with a television series, for example, and you're going to the same location every single time, uh, what we can do with this technology is go to that location once, um, film it, um, capture all of the digital content we need for that particular uh, location, and then and then make it digital and uh, and recreate that in our own space. And so, um, as you go there every single time, it's less of a carbon footprint. It's less of a of a process, if you will. Um, yeah. You know, also, if you um, consider that you could take, let's say you do uh, a, a scene that takes place in Paris and then a scene that takes place in Rome, you know, you can do those on the same day in a virtual volume. Yeah. And so you're saving all those uh, flights. I think the other thing is in all of the pre-production and location scouting, very often a location scout will be two months of people traveling all over the world trying to figure out where they're going to go. And they probably go to five times more places than they end up shooting in because they're mm -hmm. trying to figure out where to shoot. And now all of that can be done virtually. Um, and then there's reshoots. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times they'll get to the post-production process and say, this is just not working. We need to reshoot this or uh, we need to change this line. And so they'll have to bring the, um, the actors back. And if it's, if it's on location and to AJ's point, if it's, you know, international locations, you've got to send the whole group out there one more time. Whereas if we capture it, you know, in that one instance, then they just need to come across town, for example, if it's if it's an L.A. based, you know, uh, production group. So that's a huge cost savings, right, too. Um, that's, you know, talent that doesn't have to fly all over the place. Those are days that can be lessened. So there's that. And then there's also just the way that virtual production condenses the overall timeline of production in general. So it's almost a double whammy of cost savings because you're bringing post-production, like you said, into, mm -hmm. into production and mm -hmm. really and what's the, um, what is the most dramatic, if you guys have an example of this, uh, what's the most dramatic sort of um, time frame difference you've seen of something that could start as our special guest has arrived. <laughs> um, it could start as potentially one, you know, three month project and seeing that go so much less. Do you have one just really quickly off the top of your head? Yeah, we'll we we um, recently uh, shot a, uh, a production. It's uh, kind of a true crime, true crimes type of production. And um, uh, there were probably, I think, six, six episodes, maybe eight episodes, and, and generally between eight and 12 uh, scenes with each episode. And through our technology, we were able to uh, effectively shoot 11 different scenes in one day over just a six to eight hour time frame. And in a, in a traditional production um, setting, you're going to maybe be able to capture two or three scenes uh, over a time period of, of that length. Um, so for us to be able to um, move in fewer um, practical set pieces, um, move them in and out, and then the ability with this technology um, to change the environment literally almost instantaneously really provides us that, that flexibility um, and those efficiencies um, that allow us to move through the production process so much quicker. So a, a production that would normally take three months in, in a traditional format may take as little as two months um, or, or maybe a week or so um, uh, less or more than that. But it definitely streamlines the process and allows those greater efficiencies from a financial standpoint.
day becomes night, night becomes day. You can yeah, as we, <laughs> as we say in the production industry, uh, the best time to shoot is golden hour. Well, now we can have golden hour 24 hours a day. Right, right. All right, well, I want to introduce our very special guest. Um, here he is, Sean Tukowski. Sean uh, has been just an incredible advocate for, um, for this adv these advancements. Uh, he physically is building out the Orbital Studios data center. Um, and, you know, without much further ado, I kind of just wanted to start chatting with Sean. In the meantime, if anyone has a question they want to put into the to the chat. We're happy to get to those as we can. Um, but again, Sean is here, network architect for the data center. Um, and uh, I guess, Sean, I'll start with this. Um, we've been talking a lot about on-premise data centers, right? And the distinction between all cloud um, and then having something that's actually on on-prem. On um, are we moving towards a more hybrid cloud future? Your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Um, the 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 industry has changed uh, dramatically since COVID. I think the connected stage initiative was really about the adoption of all of these things IP. I mean, the Internet of Things have come to production at this point. We've got uh, walls, talking to lights, talking to cameras, talking to scopes. Everything is part of a network. And then there's the outside network as well. Traditionally, you know, global... Connected stages are a global support, production support product. It's not just about uh, virtual production because we have offices and, and all kinds of people uh, who need connectivity. Could be uh, video village, it could be visual effects. There's collaboration all the way down to business. There's collaboration on a connected stage um, globally, not just a specific uh, group. It's not just, um, camera, it's not just VFX. And that's all pretty new. Um, so yeah, the hybrid aspect has come into play really because we're dealing with high process compute now. We've, we've taken post-production and moved it over to uh, production for the first time uh, in, I mean, in, a, in a large capacity. And so we're starting to see a lot more throughput we're starting to see latency issues. And so there's a hybrid need of high process compute locally for VFX and even potentially some AI and some camera aspects. And that will be growing. So the on-prem aspect is a lot what the rest of the data center industry is experiencing across all verticals, transportation. Uh, all those Tesla cars have to talk in real time. When they come to a stop sign, they need to transmit that data and get it back immediately so they stop. And so that latency issue of going all the way back to a hyperscale tends to be a problem. So edge data is a growing thing throughout all industries. And we have the same thing, different concept, I mean, a different application, but we have the same problem. We cannot be waiting for a lot of uh, latency on high process compute that's very far away from us. So yes, a hybrid uh, is not only uh, growing within our industry because of our application needs, but globally in the, in, across the entire data industry. I'm gonna bring up a slide really fast here. Um, this is just a very high level of, whoops. Did that load for you? Cause it didn't for me. Yep, we see it. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Um, no, I do. Okay, so this is just a very high level of the sort of overall design that we've got going. This is, you know, orbital stage, right? Downtown LA connecting to the nearest data center, which then connects to the packet fabric network. Once in the packet fabric network, there's access to all of our, our other data centers that we have worldwide, cross connect away um, to all to vendors and your studio clients and, and all of that too. Then there's also the DIA that we can bring into this with our partner at Unitas Global. We can get to the cloud. So it's sort of like, you know, it ties everything together. Sean, what did this look like, this uh, this slide? What did this look like, you know, um, 10 years ago? Yeah, this traditionally. And we still have a lot of traditional stages. Um, and, there's, uh, and they're perfectly fine. If you're 
in a heavy technology play, which VP is, uh, virtual production is, and that mainly there's some aspects where virtual production is working with camera to the cloud or other types of uh, production mm -hmm. specific aspects, or they're also uh, collaboration. And all that is worldwide. We're also dealing with multiple departments. Camera may have a totally different cloud provider and an asset sitting in a completely different space. And it may be not even a hyperscale public cloud. It could be a private cloud uh, from a studio. So having this connectivity, having the diversity of this connectivity, <clears throat> having the ability to light up I like to call it the burger window because do you want do you want uh, uh, you know, fries with that? Do you want pickles and eggs? I mean, these these guys have the ability to pretty much light up anything and uh, go across the world in many diverse paths. And so, partnering with a group like yourselves and popping a facility really allows the diversity and the power of that stage to be uh, a technology center uh, centered around technology type plays. Traditional data uh, centers that are stages that do not have connectivity, do not have um, data centers and local data centers, have a few deficiencies to meet a lot of that expanding need in production. We have a question from the audience. Um, do you prefer or disapprove of using biometric authentication? I'm going to throw that to you, Sean. Hmm. Security is changing across the board. I've been watching uh, many groups in regards to security uh, within our space. Our space, you have to remember, we are mission critical. We are operating at carrier class. And with that comes a pretty tremendous expense. So firewalls and security as a necessity uh, are tremendously um, important. Uh, and there's many ways of, of dealing with a lot of that security. The problem is who's paying for this? Because our budgets keep getting lower and lower and a lot of it goes to creativity, but we're not seeing uh, groups like uh, Orbital who can uh, get back the investment uh, needed uh, to provide you know, heavy networks and heavy security. So it's an interesting play right now. We would love to adopt all these things. It comes down to how are we going to pay for all this? So that's a big question too. It's not that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little off your, your topic there, but it's important. We can't even go there until we figure out how fiscally we can uh, operate in that fully secured uh, area. Now, what is nice is the point to point, not hitting the internet, uh, those things that Packet Fabric uh, offers and, and others, uh, but having a point-to-point -point connection limits a lot of those um, types of uh, deficiencies within a public internet. Correct, Lisa? Yeah, and that's what we're hearing too. Is you know we don't know you know, and I'm taking this straight out of you know conversations I've had with AJ and Chris. It's we don't necessarily you know we can't put an exact amount on where this is going or the exact path that this is going to lead you know we're all sort of taking some um some educated risks here right based on creative need and a demand in the industry and so as packet fabric we're responding with you know trying to keep our build costs as out of the way as possible so that we can really be a stakeholder in this expansion too towards virtual production and, and towards stages and saying, okay, we're, we're willing to um, take this risk alongside our partners and, and really finding a way that we can all benefit from what we believe is to come in six months, a, a year, you know? Um, so we're, we're sort of all in this together. And as they say, you know, in the movie industry, looking more at the, at the back end of it all, maybe. And I have one other thing I want to add, and then AJ, maybe you can pick up uh, on the back part of this. The thing about Orbital is uh, it's very diverse. Uh, they're stage owners, so they're traditional soundstage, but they have other support uh, aspects. They're supporting virtual production and actually performing the creative aspects for a production. So there's a lot of diversity there, and um, and that need need. Uh, requires them to have that flexibility. Again, they're building networks for their personal stages. They're building networks for other people's stages. They're building networks across the entire United States and sometimes the world. And uh, and that's an ex a tremendous expense. But there's needs. They're constantly evolving. And this is where I'm going to hand it off to you, AJ. Nothing is cookie cutter. Every production has, be because it's a given application, 
if you go follow something that somebody else does, it doesn't mean that it's going to work in your application. So I throw that to you, AJ, because you have that experience where, you know, people try things, but that's not the case with this specific production. You just can't keep duplicating what other people do, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good point. And it, it's, you know, when people call us and they want to know how much it costs, it's I think they think we're, we're car salesmen because we're like, well, let's talk about your project because it really is true. You know, I don't know exactly what your needs are. And there is such a, um, you know, fast food order window of what you, what we can do for you. So, yeah, there are all those things that are possibilities. And in some cases, in many cases, actually, um, the, producers, the producers don't even really know physically what is possible. And so it's let's see what you're trying to achieve and then let's figure out how to do that. And to your point, Lisa, as far as, um, you know, not knowing where this is going to go, you know, we're kind of taking the leap of faith as well. You know, we're we're putting it out there. We're putting out this infrastructure, which we believe is going to be the future. Um, you know, we we uh, work together with Sean and Medcut because they know this stuff inside and out. And this was a part of the industry we didn't have any experience in. And adding that to what, we're, what we do very well, um, I think creates this great um, infrastructure that will eventually support the entire film industry. But again, it's like, you know, will it survive that period of time of adoption? Right. And so you guys having that leap of faith, Sean having that leap of faith really helps uh, try to build out what we believe is going to be the future. I think that yeah. um, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go. Well, yeah. I was, was going to say, you know, technology is, is uh, somebody, at some point has to take that leap of faith. And um, we know that we can't do what we what we do the way we want to do it and the most efficient and, and uh, productive and best way possible without it. And so um, it's, it's really kind of uh, saying, well, we're going to adopt this technology and we're going to uh, demonstrate how um, while there are expenses associated with it, there are also significant savings. And so um, and that's really True. always been like the, the, the greatest thing about technology um, is technology can, um, when applied properly, um, mitigate costs, um, even though it costs a little bit to get it out there initially and somebody has to do it. Um, you know, would like to think that we're, we're you know, forerunners or leaders in, the, in that regard. Um, but um, so we are taking that leap of faith and we do believe that this is the future of not just this industry, but, um, you know, pack, packet fabric, uh, you guys obviously go way beyond, you know, just working in the, in the, um, entertainment industry and production industry. And, um, I see, you know, this type of service being, um, as, um, uh, groundbreaking, if you will, um, as you know, the, the first time we, we transitioned away from um, modems, <laughs> if any of you are that old enough to remember. Modems. Yes. No, thank you for saying that. We were founded, you know, with a disruptive spirit. Our two founders, really, Anna and Jezebel, really um, said, we want to make something that has a heart and that's really going to change things. And I think that speaks to how we're willing to look at the creative vision and and help empower where you want to go and support it and we believe in that so i think yes to what you said about technology 100 percent, but it also has to be driven by that that vision okay, Chris, sure. you, you bring up a really good point in regards to the cost i mean i I guess I didn't want to frighten everybody away in regards to that, because one of the great diverse paths that we do have with packet fabric is point-to-point uh, -point connectivity, uh, private networks and such. And so that is a way we're overcoming some of those expenses and saving people money. Uh, and that is the beauty of having a data center and having the ability to pop and having great partners uh, outside of the stage. Um, so yeah, good point. Yeah, it's, it's important to know what to compare it against, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's much like when they say, well, uh, should I do the shot green screen or with virtual production? It's like, well, that's not really what you should be comparing. You should be comparing, mm -hmm. what if I do the shot in Paris versus mm -hmm. in downtown LA, and then I have to go to Rome. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing where knowing what your apples to apples actually are, you know, if the choice is let's have virtual location scout or let's all go on a European vacation. <laughs> I'd rather go on the vacation, but I think the, the studio probably would rather we stay inside with our VR headsets. 
<laughs> well, and also, you know, we're not a managed service provider. We are direct. So it's like you guys are working with a, a company that is providing you, um, you know, competitive pricing for for direct services. And yes, there's a build. But like we said before, you know, we're not necessarily looking for that right out of the gate. So it's a, it's a we're. Yeah. So I think we're all taking really creative and educated risks. And um, do we have any more questions? And if not, I think we might be ready to thank everyone for coming, unless there are any final thoughts here. You bring up a really good point also in regards to, um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. I apologize. <laughs> you, you bring up so many good points. <laughs> it couldn't have been that big. Um, it's well, morning. anybody... It'll come to you. I think it's going to still come to you. Uh, Chris? you know, I actually want to just comment on AJ's uh, comment as well. A lot of people do call us and say, hey, we're, we're exploring um, using virtual production. And um, uh, we love those phone calls, by the way. Um, and a lot of times we joke and we start out the, you know, the conversation with, look, there are no stupid questions. This is really new technology. Right. A lot of people don't understand how it works. And in fact, a lot of times you can't conceptually wrap your brain around it. Um, and uh, it takes literally seeing it happen in order for, you, for people to make those connections, to have that aha moment. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things we found at, at Orbital Studios is because of that relative dearth of, of experienced individuals, um, we have to create these environments where we can facilitate training, um, education of not just our customers, but the people that we need working for us. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about taking risks, uh, we, uh, our, our biggest risk is making sure that we have the appropriate uh, staff um, to support the productions. I mean, we can go out and buy all of the equipment and we can use Sean to make sure that everything is connected properly. And that we're using fiber and we're not using cat six, you know, those kinds of things um, that that create the challenges for us. But if we don't have the people to run the equipment to uh, deliver the services, um, uh, that's going to be a problem in and of itself. And so companies like Orbital Studios, um, uh, we are I, I would like to think most of them are developing some sort of a. a an educational arm, you know, out of their uh, out of their companies. We're working with LA City Community College um, to develop a curriculum right now where we can utilize the the, the talent coming from that school uh, to come over to our facilities, work with us, let us train them, and then you know it's kind of a double edged sword. I mean, it's it's hard for us to you know navigate through all of this, but it's also beneficial because people like AJ. Um, and uh, people like Leo, who's our DP, and other um, experienced individuals from the production industry, when we bring these people in, we can teach them how to do it our way. Not that there aren't other possible ways to do it, but they're probably wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is the way, you know, this is the way it needs to work in order for us to continue our vision of utilizing this technology to be a, um, a complement, as I said before, to the production industry. It's an orbital style that you're bringing to your productions and For sure. creatively yeah. as well as probably with the connect. It makes me glad that our portal is sort of so user friendly because there will be a time when we're going to say, hey, this is how our portal works. You sign mm -hmm. in, you spin up a connection this way, you know, it takes a minute and a half. It's easy. It's 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 user friendly. But still, you know, you're going to need somebody on the ground to 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 do that. So, yeah, and, and it is, it, sorry, Sean, it is a it is a serendipitous sort of relationship. I mean, as we're building out this uh, this studio with this technology, we meet Sean. Sean introduces us to the 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 power of networking properly and in utilizing data center standards instead of AV standards. We meet you through that. And now we've got this, you know, extended family and, um, yeah. you know, much like the little squares on this box, you know, <laughs> kind of like Brady Bunch, you know, but it's fun. I mean, it's fun to work with fun people and, and do uh, and deliver this kind of technology in a way that is uh, digestible by the, by the consumer public. So to your point, um, Lisa, you know, being able to say, look, this is all you do. You log in here and, you know, you, cr you create um, your network and you're off to the races and then, yeah. And the studio has two, 
two things going on. I mean, it, it, it's an incredible, powerful asset to provide the things that are road bumps currently in production uh, and we're mitigating them as much as possible with this additive value. But the other thing that's really important is risk mitigation. And that's really important to a producer. When you come to the stage, you know, by following standards or working with, uh, you know, high level groups that are in the data industry, there's less room for error. And there's a hell of a lot more productivity going on because we're not figuring out things uh, as they happen. We, you know, you're never going to get rid of risk. We want to be, uh, we want to mitigate it as much as possible. And by doing all these things, uh, that's pretty much what they're doing. The diversity, right. the power and risk mitigation, which is everything a producer wants to hear. Right. You have dual fiber. There is just that much of a reduced risk, right? Uh, and other, other elements. Um, so with that note, um, I don't know how the Amazon gift card works, but I hope Kezia is able to work on that with everyone. I assume there's some sort of giveaway that's going to happen. Um, but I just really want to thank everybody for coming. First and foremost, Chris, AJ, Sean, thank you all so much. Sean, thank you for coming in as a surprise guest at the last minute. Very exciting <laughs> format. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank you to everyone who joined. We're really looking forward to keeping up this conversation. Feel free to reach out to any and all of us. Um, and uh, thank you for signing on. Thank you very thank much you for the opportunity, Lisa. Thank, thank you. you. All righty. Bye. Bye-bye. See you, everyone.